Ping? Guys, guys. Heather. I'm not sure where to sit. You guys can sit. I think those seats are empty over there in the corner. By the way, we're going to Heather at our Langdell, and she has a perspective. Uh, first of in South Texas, so welcome, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I trust all of you have taken the midterm. Um, if you haven't put a reason, you should tell me about it. Uh, I'd rather you tell me that I just find your papers missing because that makes me annoyed. Uh, but I think I think everyone managed to take it. Um, also, I think maybe one or two of you had any uh, technical problems. If you did, uh, uh, just let me know so I can figure it out. Um, okay. Uh, I will send out a explanation as well as the A-plus answer when I finish grading them, so just hang tight. But I will send you something. Uh, we can talk about it maybe office hours, but I will send you a thorough explanation at some point once I figure out what everyone wrote. Okay, any questions uh, in general? Anything in your minds? Anything in general in your minds? All right, a couple announcements. Uh, there's a Malta uh, summer program. There's an information session at 1 today and 5.16, so you're uh, welcome to go to that. Um, as it turns out, C-SPAN has a feature, it's a TV show, called uh, Landmark Cases, and I'm speaking about Yik Wo. It's actually Monday uh, at 8 p.m. It's live. I'll be flying to D.C. for it, so this is perfect preparation. So my lecture today might be more Yik Wo heavy than usual, but uh, I've been doing my homework. Uh, you can call in with questions if you want to taunt me. I suppose you're, you're allowed to. But you, you can ask me questions live, so you don't have to do that. Uh, you can call in. Yeah. Why, why do you pick that gang? They pick me. Oh, really? Yeah, no, no. They, they invited me. The way it works is they, 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 uh, they pick, like, I think it's like 10 or so cases a, a season. So this season they're doing um, McCulloch v. Maryland. Um, oh, civil rights case is perfect. You, you missed it. It was yesterday, two days ago. Uh, Yik Wo, then Plessy. So basically, our reading for today is a unit. Uh, then they do Gideon, which you'll do in Crim Pro, involves the right to counsel. Uh, Griswold will do that case this year, involves contraceptives. Uh, Katz, you'll do in Crim Pro, it's about privacy and the Fourth Amendment. Uh, Brandenburg, I might mention, it's about free speech. Tinker is also about free speech. Uh, New York Times is about free speech. Uh, Gregory George is about the death penalty. And Bakke is about uh, affirmative action. They pick was it uh, for about twelve cases a season, and they invite um, two experts to come on. So I'm there for whatever reason, and the person actually specializes in you know the history of the Chinese American experience. It's actually, a historian who knows what she's talking about. I'll hopefully sound somewhat literate and competent. I hope we'll see. But uh, you're welcome to watch. It's on uh, uh, eight eight o'clock p.m. on uh, Saturday night. Exactly what you want to do during spring break? Listening to me? <laughs> Not okay. Other questions. All right, so again, uh, I want to start you off with a question, and it's about the middle case. We'll start off with civil rights cases, but I want to actually start here, because uh, I think it sets, sets up the um, discussion quite well. Okay, so your question is this. All right, which of the following are true? Yikwo was assigned the basis of the protection clause, A. Eh? Yikwo is assigned the base of due process. B, uh, both of the above are true, or neither of the above are true. Let's see what happens here. And I'll tell you in advance, even scholars disagree on the answer to this question, so there's not a right or wrong. There's something that people don't all agree on, exactly what the basis of the opinion was. I'm use just one more day. I'm almost there. Got to be healthy for C-SPAN. All right, here we go. That looks ridiculous, but it works. Okay, another, another 10 seconds or so. All right. Uh, I don't remember where I left off. Who? Uh, who's next? Jake, you next? Okay, so, okay, Jonathan, are you, are you next? Yeah, can be. No, said, are you are you next? It was no, it was Ryan was next. And then so Ryan was next, so unfortunately that falls to you, Jonathan. I, I went with A. Okay. Direction. Why do you say A? Uh, basically, because the last paragraph. The last paragraph, yeah. What about the other three pages? Um, it's not as compelling. 
compelling to me. No, I don't care if it's compelling, but what provision of the Constitution are they relying on? That's my question. You're, you're very right. The last paragraph talks about race and everything else, right? But stuff that came before. Hmm. Oh. Do, do what? Due process. Oh. Clint, what do you think here? I agree and disagree at the same time. But I think it was both. <laughs> you do? Um, well, tell me why you think it was both. Well, because the first, like the mid part of, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out which paragraph this is. Yeah. It's the rights of the fiscal in their defective proceeding of which they complain are no less because they are aliens and subject to the emperor of, emperor of China. The 14th Amendment of the Constitution is not defined to protection of citizens. It says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It says that, doesn't it? It says that, and so that is where I agree with Jonathan. We talked about it. You know, you, if you read the last paragraph, it, it very much switches back and forth. Yeah. But I think it's a combination of the two. I think there was, hey, I have to do a lot of setup work, but hey, it's also this. Ah, so you think the setup was due process, but the closing was equal protection. Is that your answer? Yes. I mean. Okay. Evan, what, what, I'll give it a go. What, what do you think here? I, I, we're getting a little bit, a little bit of debate here, which is good. I, I agree with Jonathan. I think it was about equal protection because uh, there was, the Chinese people were not being treated equally. As ah. As, uh, All right. Jeffrey, let me ask you this question. What if instead of it, what if the facts were different? Let me change the facts, right? What if instead of the government only denying Chinese people these laundry licenses, the government only gave laundry license to people who donate to political campaigns, right? That if you donated money to the sheriff's campaign, you were given a laundry license. And if you voted for the other guy, right, you were denied a permit. Would this case turn out any differently? That was a worse what it's doing is an equal protection of law and everything on all the rights. It, technically, it's not based on race at this point, so it wouldn't. Well, so I think you just changed your answer mid-sentence. So let me ask the question again. Would this case turn out differently if the rule was that people gave political donations to the sheriff, got their licenses, and people who you know, voted for the other guy didn't? Would, that, would it change the outcome of the case? Yeah, I believe it would. Just, it is not based on race at that point. So you, you think you think then there will be a defeat, right? That the person who didn't get the political donation would, would lose. Yeah. Jonathan, yeah, weren't they talking about the intent and the effect of the law? Because the law didn't say if you were Chinese you couldn't do it. They just only gave it to white people. So if, if all the people who donated to the sheriff were white, then then I would say yeah. Ah, uh, sorry, no name tag. Uh, Alan. Alan. Why? Why do you think? Or uh, let me ask the question like this. Clint said a minute ago that the state can't deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. How is that clause relevant to this case? None of you have gotten quite else. We can push you a little further. How is that clause relevant to this case? No state shall deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Why is that why is that provision relevant, my friend? Basically, if you don't have a good reason under the law to deprive them of anything. Deprive them of what? What's anything here? The rights. What right are we talking about here? Now we're getting somewhere. The right to open a business. Or and where have we talked about this before? What case? We haven't only really done a couple of cases on this, but where do we talk about this? Is it the slaughterhouses? I heard someone whisper it, but yeah, that's right. <laughs> slaughterhouse, right? You remember slaughterhouse? Abdul, what were the facts of slaughterhouse? Remember? Yeah. Um, basically, one of the Very good. They said they claimed it was public safety because of the river. And, and what did the butchers say? What was the butchers' basis of their lawsuit? What did the butchers assert that this monopoly did to them? Why did the butchers assert that this monopoly was unconstitutional? Yeah? Well, they assert that they also have the right to the uh, butcher shop as well. And they have the right to do what? To work. Yes, the right to earn a lawful living, right? The, the right to pursue a lawful occupation. The Chinese launderers, in this case, had a very similar argument, right? 
I'm sure they were upset that they were being denied this license because of their, of their race. No question about that. But their real problem is not just racial discrimination, but that it was violating the right to earn a living. Right? They held these laundry mats for years and years and years, and no one had a problem. There was no fires. There was no security issues, right? And then all of a sudden, this new law is passed where they have to apply for this meaningless license. So their, their beef, so to speak, right, their grievance was not just it was racial discrimination, that's certainly true, but that they're being thrown in jail for exercising their professions. Now, McKinney, what was the basis for the issuance of a license, right? How, what were the standards that the launderers had to satisfy in order to get one of these licenses to operate their business? Uh, so they couldn't operate the laundry mats in uh, wooden buildings. Okay. And they had to apply for a license. Right. So if they wanted to operate the laundry mats in wooden buildings, by the way, this was California in the 1800s. Everything was wood. Right. Every, th there were not many stone buildings back then, right? So McKinney, if they wanted to operate their business in a, in a, in a wood um, structure, what would they have to do? Uh, yeah, they had to go to the San Francisco city and they had to apply for a permit. Okay, and what were the standards on which those permits could be granted or denied? Uh, oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't really remember that. Uh, were there any standards? It didn't seem like there were any clear-cut standards. It was pretty arbitrary. Ah! You used a really good word there, McKinney. Arbitrary. What is, I'll, I'll go in a minute, Ivan, but just one more. What does arbitrary mean? Uh, without real consideration. It's, or without... It's what, it's what you feel like. Yeah, without... Any, Due process. <laughs> Very good. Everyone heard what he said, right? The regime, the law in this case, was completely arbitrary. It was random, right? It was completely random. You would apply for this permit, and it'd be up to the sheriff or the board of supervisors, whoever it is, his good graces. If he likes you, if he doesn't, right? It's completely random. It's not saying if you have, you know, a sprinkler system, they're not sprinkler, you know, if you have some sort of fire safety measures installed, right? Or if you have proper ventilation, or I don't know, you can make up whatever you want. It, you have to apply for a permit, maybe you'll get it, maybe you won't. But it was arbitrary, and I think McKinney said it correctly, as I was pointing to the thing you can see. It's not consistent with the due process of law, because there's no process. You apply for it, it's random. Yes, McKinney? So, uh, in the slaughterhouse cases, I thought one of the reasons why the court came back and said that it wasn't a violation of due process is because the law being passed by the legislatures was due process. So why is it different here? Does slaughterhouse consider due process? Well, I thought that was one of the reasons that the court they said that oh. it wasn't the legislator that was due process. So with the slaughterhouse case, let me answer your question briefly. The law applied equally to everyone, right? <clears throat> everyone had to... Um, go to the same slaughterhouse. The problem there was whether the monopoly intruded on economic freedom. Yikwo is a little bit different, right? The law didn't apply to everyone equally, right? You would apply for this permit, and whether it was granted or not, it's completely arbitrary. So that it went through the legislative process isn't enough, right? That's comport due process. Now, Yvonne, let me ask the question I asked to Jeffrey a minute ago. We agree, it's completely random who gets a permit on it, completely random, right? So, what if instead of a bunch of racists rang the system. There was a bunch of, you know, uh, people like campaign donations, right? And the sheriff said, hey, you guys want your permit? Support my campaign. You vote for the other guy? Support the other guy? Not getting a permit. Would that make the deprivation of the right any different? No. no. So I think, and this goes back to the Clinton and Jonathan question beginning, this case doesn't turn on race. It does ultimately, right? Race plays a factor in it. But the, the far more narrow question is, is there a property or a liberty interest being violated in an arbitrary fashion that's not in accordance with the due process of law? And I think all four or five of you said is completely random. And that's enough to decide the case. But then we get to the last paragraph that Jonathan brought up a few minutes ago. And that, without a doubt, says, this is not providing an equal protection of the laws because it falls disproportionately only on the Chinese uh, launderers. Right? So I think the answer is both. I think I, I wrote this question last night on a plane. I was a little bit groggy, but I think the answer is probably both. Um, 
but I, I don't think anyone's, I wouldn't begrudge anyone for first for saying A either. Let's see what we got. Yeah, I think the answer is probably both. I think it's probably the C. Um, but you can't, I don't think you can say A conclusively um, because there is this discussion of a liberty interest being violated. Now, what makes it complicated, though, and I'll get to you in one second, I promise, is a court's not focusing solely on the statute on its face. They also look at how it's being applied with this evil eye and uneven hand, is a phrase which is used throughout. And that's where I think you have to put in equal protection to it. But you only get there because there's a right in the first place to be violated. In other words, it deprives of equal protection because... There's a right in the first place protected by the due process clause. I mean, that's what I'm going to say on TV on Monday. But I think I think that's the way I, that, that I'm looking at. I don't know. Now I saw a few hands. I, Damon, your hand was up, and I think someone, the, a wit was hand up. So Damon and then wit. Yeah, my question is: um, Does this permit? Uh, does it matter if it's a uh, like state-related permit or federal or private permit? Uh, and uh, in this case, it was a state. Right. If it was a federal permit, was it easier to interpret it was, it's unconstitutional? Well, it was private. well, Damon, let's look at the 14th Amendment, right? Does the 14th Amendment put limitations on the state governments or the federal governments? Okay. So Damon's question was, would this be different with the federal government? Um, there is no federal equal protection clause that doesn't exist, but there is a federal due process clause. And if you recall, we did a case called Atkins versus Children's Hospital. No, we haven't done it yet. So we will do that case in a few weeks. Called Atkins versus Children's Hospital, which involved a minimum wage law in the District of Columbia. And the court found that that violated this right of economic liberty. So we will do cases where uh, federal laws are held to a very similar standard. Uh, Whit, your hand was up. I think you kind of answered this right before. Good. I try. But when I look at this, if I see a, a violation of due process, my mind automatically thinks, flowing from that, you're uh, also a violation of, of equal protection because due process is a right which we all have. Uh, so, all so let's actually, this is actually why I posed the question. I think Witt put the question very well. What do these clauses actually mean? Right? That this is actually, Witt, your question is perfect, which is why I frame my lead off this way, right? All right, we did citizenship, right? We talked about this last week, right? If you're born in the United States and you're subject to our jurisdiction, you're a citizen. Notice how Justice Harlan, though, speaks of Chinese people in, in, the, in, the, set, in, the, in the final case, the Plessy case. Okay? He says they're not subject to our jurisdiction, they're subject to the Emperor of China. By the way, why do they keep saying they're subject to the Emperor of China? Why do they keep saying that? Because they're not citizens. That, that, that's the reason. I mean, that, that's, that's exactly the reason. They do not consider them subject to our jurisdiction. Okay? But that's only for citizens. And only citizens get these privileges or immunities. This was Slaughterhouse, right? Which is a very narrow subset of rights. Then we come down to these number three and four, these other two provisions in section one, which is where I want to start for, for today. Okay? Notice it applies not to person, I'm sorry, not to citizens, but to persons. Right? The first two clauses concern citizens, and the second two clauses concern persons. Not men, not women, persons. Okay, not, not whites, not blacks, persons. Okay, and it says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. And then the next clause says, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So wit's like, Wait a minute, what's the difference, right? The first one says you can't deprive people of any rights. The second one says you have to protect them equally. Isn't that the same thing? And, one second, Kevin. And if they are the same thing, why are they different provisions? Do we assume that the framers just drafted redundant clauses of the Constitution that do the exact same thing? Or are they different? Are they doing different functions? And maybe one applies and the second one doesn't, or the second one applies the first doesn't. In Yik Roll, I think I told you a minute ago, I think that they're both implicated. 
Wait, you want to take a step? Yeah, I just, to follow up with that, I, I see the due process clause as establishing the liberty to the persons and the equal protection clause as an establishment of the duty upon the government to then uh, enforce those liberty interests. Ah, so what Witt says is if there's no liberty interest, then the government doesn't have to enforce it equally. So you do first due process and equal protection? Well, just the equal protection, if it wasn't there, you know, you could say, like, yeah, you have these, uh, these rights, but, okay, like, you know, no, if, there, if no one's there to protect them, then it doesn't really mean anything. So we're going to make sure. Uh, uh, Ivana called in you, right? Uh, I think, Alex, you're next? Yeah. Alex. All right, so, hold this a second, Alex. We will spend a lot of time in due process. I don't want to dwell on it today. We'll spend probably six weeks on it. I want to focus on equal protection because that's where we're staying today. Alex, what does that phrase mean? The equal protection of the laws. What? Forget case law, forget everything else. Just if you saw that phrase in a you know book somewhere, it said equal protection of laws. What does that phrase mean? Uh, I think it applies to the law. Well, apply to each person so like you would um, you wouldn't apply a law differently towards one person as you would in a different person uh, okay just, you, know, with, with, you know the Chinese people the, the law was applied differently so what if you have a law that says uh, people of African descent go in this train car and people in white descent go this train car and everyone's in their own train car and you, you apply that law fairly and equally to everyone <laughs> oh I know that's a tough question <laughs> I know that's a tough question. That's why I'm asking it to you. you. I'm using your definition. It's exactly yeah, what you told I think me. My definition was flawed, I guess. Well, maybe uh, it was. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, a April, let me ask you. I'll, I'll put Alex off the spot for a minute, right? What does this phrase "equal protection of the laws" mean? <laughs> oh, I know you want to say that because you read the other case, right? But you're the Harlan dissent. I'm, I'm, I'm asking just the text, right? Just the text of the Fourteenth uh, Amendment. Nothing, nothing else, April. What does protection mean? Put equal aside for a minute, right? Let's focus. What does protection, the study guide question on this, what does protection mean? It should be necessary. Well, if I say the government must provide protection, what does that mean? Oh, I think we'll scratch our chins. Right? If I say the government provides you protection, what, what do you think that would mean? Protect you from what? Oh. Nick, <coughs> protect you from what? What do you think the framers of the 14th Amendment might have had in mind when they were saying that we're going to guarantee that the states provide protection equally? Protection from what? Discrimination. Oh, what kind of discrimination? Right, so we're getting at something a little bit deep here, right? And I don't, I don't mean to put this um, lightly, but um, there's a big debate about what this phrase protection means. This is not, I, I don't need to put April and Alex on the spot, I apologize, but like 150 years later, we still don't really know what they meant, right? I mean, I'll give you 15 books with 15 theories, so, but my point is, Clint, I'll get you a second. It's not exactly clear, but what is troubling, though, is Alex's first definition. I'm not mad at you because you gave the most logical definition. Because if you mean this ser uh, sincerely, that law must be applied equally to different people, right? Then you can have a separate but equal law. It doesn't say that the law must be applied equally across the races. It does not say that. And I want to next show you. Oh, Clint, I'll get to you in a minute. I promise. That's a big deal. Okay. To you remember the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Right, this was a very big statute. And a lot of people, sometimes I think, I'm not sure I go back and forth, believe that this was the basis for the 14th Amendment. This provision expressly does what Alex said, right? It expressly does what Alex said, right? It says every citizen, such citizens of every race and color without regard to servitude or slavery uh, uh, shall have the same rights. And it goes on and on the various rights. And even says, as is enjoyed by white citizens, the same equal benefit of laws as is enjoyed by white citizens. 
Second Regina Primus. This statute expressly says that white citizens should be treated the same as black citizens, right? It, it expressly says that in color and race. It says it right there. But the 14th Amendment doesn't say that. Uh, with Clinton and Regina? So my, my question was, you have pro pro protection broken up with a, that's not the way it is. It oh, that was just a copy and paste error. Okay. That was copy and paste <laughs> error. That that no, there's no, there's nothing. Okay. Yes, Regina. When I look at the equal protection, I'm not looking at it from a perspective of uh, applying it to everybody. Mm -hmm. After reading all of the stuff about intent, I more or less think of it as they're kind of setting up the fact that these laws or these rights are established for uh -huh. people. Mm -hmm. So we'll guarantee equal, it'll be equal enough making sure that you get those rights, not the actual application of you know granting them to everybody. Uh, so its rights have to be granted to everyone. So that's already kind of established in their intent that everyone's going to get even ready by you know the other amendment. And the equal protection is just saying that we're going to ensure that everybody um, gets to exercise so let, let me ask you a follow-up if I can. Um, Yik Wo, right, the case we talked about a minute ago. And we'll come back to Yik Wo, I promise. I, assuming that you have this right to own a business and run a laundromat, your argument is then this should be given equally to everyone. It can't be withheld on the basis of race or arbitrarily. What, what, what's, what's your line? That the same, so they've already granted the fact that everybody has the right to own a business. So where equal protection would come in, is if a problem arises, someone is trying to prevent you from your, you know, deprive you of your right to own a business, then the laws need to come in and reinforce the fact that everybody should be able to, and this is wrong that they're depriving. And is depriving the basis of race or depriving at all? I would say depriving at all. Ah, okay, so it's not necessarily tinged, uh, connected with race. Is that your... Okay, everyone heard Regina's point. I think she made a very good point, right? She says... It's not only premised on depriving someone of right based on their race, like because Yikwo is of Chinese descent. It's that the right exists, number one, and then number two, if it's being deprived at all. Okay? Now, let me modify that a little bit, right? The government can deprive your rights. Let's say you're running a laundromat and like you have this like massive flame next to a wooden structure and it could like burn down the entire city. Can't the government say, we want proper ventilation? I think so. I think they could. But this was completely random. So let me just put a slight caveat, Regina's theory. It's when the right is violated without an adequate <coughs> justification, right? This was arbitrary, random. That the rights can't be deprived randomly, right? But if that's the case, then what does equal protection add, right? Isn't due process that exact question? Is the right being deprived randomly without giving a proper process, without a fairness to it? So that, 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 that circles back, what is equal protection even adding? If it's not based on race. If it is based on race, like the Civil Rights Act was, then it's easy. Right? That's an easy question. But if it's not, what is equal protection adding? Kevin? So is it fair to say, I guess, equal protection, the equal protection part of this, the actual drafting of the law and due process goes to the actual intent behind its execution? So the way I'm reading, um, the no, nor shall any state deprive. I'm reading deprive as the intent behind its execution? Um, I don't think the matter which, well, the, there are some people who think, so, okay, for example, the Privileges or Immunities Clause says no state shall make or enforce any law. That would refer to the legislative branch, right, of a state. Would refer to the executive branch, right? So in other words, if the law on its face is neutral, but as it's being applied, it's violating your rights, that would not violate the Privileges or Immunities Clause. But it would violate due process because it's a state, not just a legislative branch, but the state as a whole. Uh, some people draw that distinction. I, I, don't, I don't know if I do, but, but some people do put a lot of weight on whether it's a law being made by the legislative branch or all branches of the state government. Because this one applies to the courts, the state courts, the state legislature, and the governor and the sheriff and everyone on top to bottom. Everyone else. All right, so I don't want to resolve this debate because I don't think there's an answer. Um, very often when you're dealing with the provision, the Constitution is 150 years old, there are 150 theories. Uh, but I at least want you to see that it isn't entirely clear 
where the line is between due process and equal protection. There's some blurriness to that. And when we do cases involving interracial marriage, the court addresses that fuzziness. Uh, when we do a case involving same-sex marriage later this term, the court addresses that fuzziness. Not well, but they address it. I just want you to be on, on, on the lookout for that. Okay. Anyone else had questions on the um, whatever we're just doing for half an hour? I don't know what you call it on a case yet. All right, Carlos, I think you're up. You want to give me the facts, please, in our first case, the civil rights case. By the way, the name of this case is confusing, right? Because you all say, oh yeah, these cases are about civil rights. No, no. The case was actually called the civil rights cases. It's not like X versus Y. It was the civil rights cases. And the reason why is that there were five separate cases that were um, consolidated into a single appeal. So if I ever like ask you the civil rights cases, I'm not asking for like Casabac or Ollie's Barbecue or Hearts of Atlanta Motel. I'm asking for this case. Just because invariably in the exam, someone screws that up and it, it makes me sad. So just get the name of the case right. Um, Carlos, all right. So you want to give us the facts, please, in uh, civil rights cases? Very good, okay. Um, and tell me a little bit about this Civil Rights Act of 1875. Well, uh, the sections of it uh, essentially prohibited uh, discrimination uh, against individuals and, and establishments. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I think they were aiming more for uh, commercial stuff like restaurants, good. hotels, and Very good. Uh, um, just business in general. Very good. Okay, so everyone heard what Carlos said, right? Congress passes in 1875 a very important civil rights act. And I put up the language of at least part of it on the board for you. And it says, all persons within the United States, again, not all citizens, all persons, important word, all persons shall be entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of the accommodations, of facilities, and privileges of inns. Uh, public conveyances on land and water, that means boats and railroads, uh, theaters, and other places of amusement. That means like restaurants and uh, 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 theaters and concert halls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks so much, Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Love you I know it, I know it. Come back all the time. <laughs> all right. And again, unlike the 14th Amendment, it says expressly, this is applicable like the citizens of every race and color regardless of any previous condition of servitude. Again, this is expressed. The 14th Amendment doesn't have this sort of language in it. This one makes it clear. Black, white, it doesn't matter. It has to be treated the same. This is Alex's definition. If Congress had put this language in the 14th Amendment, we'd have a very different constitution, by the way. A very different constitution, I think. Okay? Because notice it doesn't say gender, right? So you do, you do have that plus and minus, right? The 14th Amendment could be opened up to saying gender, but this one is race. Anyway. But then section two is important, right? This twice. Section two says any person who violates a section by depriving a citizen on the basis of race or color, blah, 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 right? Can be prosecuted for a crime. Okay? Let me make this clear. It was a crime to deprive a person of access to a theater based on their race. It was a crime. The U.S. attorney could prosecute you. And there were damages and penalties. You go to jail, right? Fine, unless $500. That's a lot of money back then. Jail for up to a year. This was trying to make racial discrimination a crime, right? Not just a civil matter, a legit crime. Now, I want to contrast for you the Civil Rights Act of 1866 with the Civil Rights Act of 75. Again, this applies to any person who owns a business, right? If you own a business, a restaurant or a theater or whatever, you can go to jail for violating someone's rights. Go back up to the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Oh, well, you can't fit on one screen, but here it is, right? Section two. It says any person under color of law or statute regulation deprives someone of their rights. Everyone see the difference, right? <coughs> The Civil Rights Act of 66 only applies to people acting under the color of law, which means they're acting pursuant to government power, government officials. 
the Civil Rights Act of 75 apply to any person, period, whether or not they're a government, specifically private businesses. Yeah, Gabriel. No, no, no. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 only affects private businesses. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 only affects government officials. You see the difference? So, Danielle, what's the big difference there between 66 and 75? Why is that make such a big difference of who it applies to? Why does it make such a difference that the Civil Rights Act of 66 applies to government officials and the Civil Rights Act of 75 applies to everyone? Why does that make such a big difference? That's true, but why does it make a difference? Brian? Ah, so here's the issue, right? Does Congress have the power to enact these provisions of law? Does Congress have the power to enact the Civil Rights Act of 66, which goes after government officials? Does Congress have the power to enact the Civil Rights Act of 75, which goes after private businesses? Okay. So, this, the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868 after, right, 1868 comes after 66, right? Easy. Does the 14th Amendment give Congress the power to punish government officials who violate people's rights? Let's go back down to our 14th Amendment, right? Okay. And here's Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. Very, very important provision. We've studied this before. Right? I told you, when I say Section 5, I'm talking to you about Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. That's what I'm talking about. And it says, the Congress shall have the power, let's put this down. The Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Okay? Uh, Stacy, what does that mean? What does Section 5 mean? Tell me, please. Good. Good. Uh, let, me, let me tweak it a little bit more, Stacey. When it says the power to enforce the provisions of this article, what does that mean, the provisions of this article? What is it referring to? What's the article we're talking about here? Good, right. This is section five of the 14th Amendment. What this provision says is they have the power to enforce sections one through four, right? And I'll put this in parentheses so you don't, right? This is saying the provision sections one through four, Congress now has the power to enforce those. And they can act legislation. Again, not any legislation, but appropriate legislation. And we studied this before. In case like Bernie v. City of Flores, or I'm sorry, City of Bernie versus Flores, right? And United States versus Morrison. Was Congress acting properly under its Section 5 powers to waive a state's sovereign immunity? And the court said, is it appropriate legislation or is it inappropriate? That comes much later. But here, the question is, does Congress have the power to enforce these laws? So everyone, I think, agrees that following the ratification of the 14th Amendment, Congress could enact the Civil Rights Act of 66. Why? It applies to state action, right? It says that states can't deprive people of rights, state officials. And all this stuff is about states violating people's rights. So without a doubt, <laughs> without much doubt, the 14th Amendment solidified the Civil Rights Act of 66. 
But the question presented for all of you in the civil rights cases, can they go beyond this? Can Congress regulate not just state actors, but private business owners? In other words, when they say that no state shall make or enforce a law, no state shall deprive, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protections, does that refer to <coughs> individual business owners, right? Stating it very simply, did Congress have the power under Section 5 to enact the Civil Rights Act of 1975? 1875, that is your question. Did Congress have the power under Section 5 to enact the Civil Rights Act of 1875? That is the question. Ryan, your hands up. Okay, that's okay. So, Michaela, did Congress have the power, according to the court, to enact the Civil Rights Act of 75? Louder? No. That's right, no. Okay, tell me why not. Well, you're right. They say leave it to the states, but why does it, I want to focus on this question first, uh, Michaela. Why does the 14th Amendment not give Congress the power to enact uh, the Civil Rights Act of 75? That, that, that's, that's the magic question here. What about it? Well, I don't think it's the word people. There's another word in that sentence that is much relevant to people. What word or words in the 14th Amendment suggests that Congress lacks this power, Michaela? <coughs> No, 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 no. Yeah, Regina? Bingo. No state. And it says it in several places, right? No state, no state, no state. Regina, why does the court think that this phrase no state means that they can't go after um, private business owners? Very good. I'll give you a second, Jonathan, right? So the simple holding, right, of the civil rights cases is what's known as the state action doctrine. What's called the state action doctrine. The idea is that Congress, through the 14th Amendment, can only regulate state action, that is action by the state. That could be the governor, the mayor, the sheriff, whatever it is, but that's to be acting under the color of law. And by the color of law doesn't mean skin color. It means they're acting under the cover, right? Under the auspices of some sort of state law. Right? If, you know, I censor your free speech rights, good luck suing me because I'm not a state actor. I work at a private university. If you're at UH downtown and your professor censors your speech rights, guess what? You can sue me in court. You can sue me in court for violating your speech rights. Private individuals cannot violate your rights, right? If Facebook deletes your blog post, or Facebook deletes your post because they, they think you're whatever, you can't sue them for violation of free speech. Right? What if your local sheriff's department has a Facebook page and they start deleting your comments? Is that a free speech issue? That's actually a very live question right now. A lot of people have that issue. But Facebook is not a state actor. They can censor your speech all they want. Twitter, not a state actor. YouTube, they can delist you, deplatform you, do whatever they want. But they're not government. This case is still good law. One second, I, I got you, promise. These, this case is still good law, civil rights cases. That state action is only actors of the state. You can't go after private individuals. This is why when you get the Cats of Act, Ollie's Barbecue, and Hearts of Atlanta, JC, what clause does Congress rely on to go after segregation in the, 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 the barbecue shop in the hotel? Well, they basically looked at Justice Harlan's dissent and each time... No, 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 no. In, this is a review. Clause. Commerce Clause. Yeah, you give me way too complicated, right? And why did they go after Commerce Clause and not the 14th Amendment? Do you remember? Or not? Now do you know why? Yes, sir. And, but looking at no, no, I don't like the Harlan yet. I promise I'll get to Harlan. Why in Katzenbach and, and the Hearts of Atlanta did they not rely on the 14th Amendment? What's the problem there? Because? Because they wanted to say. Exactly. Now you know the answer, right? The reason why the 1960 civil rights laws were passed primarily under the Commerce Clause is because of this case. Civil rights case was still good law 100 years later, 80 whatever years later, right? 
This is why I think there was Justice <laughs> Douglas' concurring opinion. Check my notes on this, right? But there was a concurring opinion saying he, we should revisit the, slot, um, the civil rights cases, but they couldn't. For that reason, our civil rights laws today are not premised on the Civil Rights Amendment. Isn't that perverse, right? Isn't that bizarre? That the laws we have in this country, 50 years old, designed to promote racial equality, are not premised on the amendment passed after the Civil War. They're premised on the Commerce Clause. Boring, right? Right? Interstate commerce. You import your barbecue sauce from Georgia, so your commerce. Whatever it was, right? That's where we are. Okay. Jonathan, and then someone else, and then Brian. So Jonathan. That was what my question was about, but Good. the powers didn't change, so did they have the powers then to do it? Yeah, they just didn't apply it the same way, because if I look at the railroad case today, railroad is interstate. I mean, I don't care if you're going between station A and B, eventually they all connect and go interstate. Oh, that, that comes later in time, doesn't it? Originally, that wasn't interstate commerce. Alex, was your hand up also? Yeah, it was, uh, I was talking about the, uh, you know, how this connects with, like, you know, the, the wedding cake that's now uh, Jonathan, you know that earlier today. Yeah, maybe I'll let me answer your question. So, uh, you know, how, how is that any, any different, I guess, than, or, or what are the similarities and differences between those two? Um, okay, I'll, I'll address it here. Um, <laughs> I, I can do it. It's, uh, I can walk and chew gum. Um, uh, so, so there's a case that's pending for the court this year um, called the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. Um, and the facts of the case like this, you had a Christian baker in Colorado that had a very specific set of standards to make cakes. Uh, he wouldn't make cakes that violate religion, so he wouldn't make a cake honoring a divorce, right? Someone asked him to make a cake, a wedding cake, and like slice it in half, and like, you know, divorce. Uh, he wouldn't make a Halloween cake, he thinks it's pagan worshiping. Um, he wouldn't make a cake involving alcohol, people like putting, you know, champagne or whatever in cakes. He, it was a bad Christian, didn't want to drink. Um, a, a gay couple walked in, asked, well, facts are a little bit murky, but they inquired about a cake for a commitment ceremony. Colorado didn't allow weddings at the time. And he said, I'm sorry, I won't. And he said, you know, check out another bakery. Um, the State Human Rights Commission brought a complaint. This case is about not whether Colorado has the power to protect um, against discrimination, right? States do have the power to protect against discrimination. Civil rights case about Congress. So if you notice, the opinion says this is for states to decide. States want to protect it. So Colorado has provided protections for LGBT discrimination. The question there is whether the First Amendment speech or religion clauses trumps the state discrimination law. Because federal law is supreme law of the land. So it's very much different, right? Even if Congress can't enact these laws, the states under the police power can. And I think civil rights acknowledge that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. I just didn't know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very similar. Yeah, uh, well, you no, know, well, that, that's why I get the small box. Yeah, Jonathan, you want anything else? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm switching back and forth on the sides of that. He emails me at least once a week on this case. It, it, it's very, very enjoyable. <laughs> but I, I liked what Harlan said, like, you can't compel people. All right, to... well, we'll, we'll get to Harlan in a minute, I promise. You want, you're, you're itching to get to Harlan, I, I understand. But anyone else questions on the majority, right? Okay, let me summarize a few. Uh, Brian, yeah. Oh, doesn't it? It does. Yep. Yep. So, so everyone understand um, Brian's question. It's a very good question, right? We spent. Uh, a full class or two on the necessary and proper clause, right? And it says, Congress shall have all powers that are necessary and proper to execute the foregoing powers. It's very similar, right? But the key thing is foregoing powers. It's not that Congress has read, I'm sorry, it's not that the courts read necessary and proper broadly, they've read commerce broadly, right? The key point is foregoing provision of this article. If sections one through four don't cover private action, then you can never get elastic to reach in private action, right? In other words, if sections one through four don't sweep in private action, section five won't get there. Harlan disagrees. We'll get to Harlan in a minute, but that's the majority. JC. But also during the time when the Chief Justice Chase and Chief Justice Bullock were necessary and proper in commerce, were read narrowly? I think Chase was dead at this point. Uh, but but uh, yes, you are right that necessary and proper is read narrowly, but that, that 
That question secondary is, does section one through four refer to private action or just state action? But Harlan reads it very differently. We'll get to Harlan in a minute. But let, let me summarize majority uh, briefly, okay? They say that these laws prohibiting discrimination must be local. If a state wants to prohibit discrimination, they can do so, but it's not for Congress to do this, right? Congress cannot reach private action. They can only reach state action. And we'll get to the 13th Amendment in Harlan in a minute, I promise. Clinton? Do you think that they got that right? No, I think this case is wrong. Yeah, I, I think this case is wrong. Why? Harlan. <laughs> Uh, we'll do Harlan. I think Harlan gets a better argument here. Yeah, Regina? Well, we'll get to Plessy a little bit later, but Plessy was a state law, wasn't it? Plessy was a state law that excluded train cars, right? Mm -hmm. So even with a state law, they, they sneak by. So I think they were, the Supreme Court, if you couldn't tell by now, was intent on reading the 14th Amendment as narrowly as possible. We did Slaughterhouse, right? You did Bradwell, the Illinois, right? That was a woman who wanted to go to the bar. And now we have um, civil rights cases, and you got Plessy in a few minutes. And as I told you, Yikwa wasn't really about race either. So basically, all these cases, which came in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, with the exception of maybe one I can think of, read race protections really narrowly, even when state action was involved. But I want to talk about Harlan for a minute. I, I do think this case was wrongly decided. Um, Harlan, I think, gets closer. Um, let's go to the 13th Amendment. Ratified in 1865. You know, this is Lincoln's triumph to get this ratified. Okay, is that a hand, Bianca? Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, ask that question about a month. But we'll get there. We'll get there, I promise. I'm, I'm not dodging, but we, got, we have a lot of work to do before I get to that question. Okay, but let's focus on the 13th Amendment for a minute, right? And it says, uh, who am I up to? I think, Denny, you're next, right? So, Denny, it says... Uh, section 1 says neither... Yeah, you can read it. That's fine. I was going to read it. Save my voice. Um... <laughs> Neither slavery nor in involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. To their jurisdiction. Okay. And then in section two, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Yeah, okay. So section two of the thirteenth amendment is basically verbatim what section five of the fourteenth amendment, right? It says Congress has the power to enforce this legislation by appropriate Sorry, Congress has the power to force this amendment by appropriate legislation. So, Denny, when the 14th Amendment says slavery nor involuntary servitude, what are they talking about there? Say again, I didn't get that question. Sorry. When the 13th Amendment speaks of slavery and involuntary servitude, what are they getting at there? What does that mean? Well, the, the court would say that it, it has to do with Slavery itself, and then the, the, uh, but but not the laws. So the majority opinion says not the laws that are attached, or the, the laws that group around it. So the ends, the etc. Uh, okay, let, let, I think I'm correct. Let, let me let me let me repurpose your answer. Okay. Does the majority limit slavery to just chattel slavery, a person held to servitude to a person in in, in plantation? Yeah. How does the majority read sl slavery? Um, well, they they talk about how. Um, So yeah, I, I would basically say that, that the majority restriction to slavery as understood um, prior to the Civil War. Okay. All right. So I want to understand. The majority has a problem with the 13th Amendment. Okay? The 14th Amendment applies only to states. Right? We know that. The 14th Amendment applies only to states. The 13th Amendment has no such limitation. It says that slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the United States. That applies to government. It also applies to private businesses, right? Private businesses could no longer own slaves. 
But the majority says the 13th Amendment's irrelevant to the Civil Rights Act of 75. Why? Because it talks about slavery. It doesn't talk about access to restaurants and hotels. That's slavery. But then you get to Harlan. Right? And this is where I think Harlan probably gets it right. I, you know, I go back and forth. I think Harlan has the better argument for sure here between the two. Uh, Warren. Warren, how does Harlan understand this phrase, slavery or involuntary servitude? He, he has a much broader perception of what this is than does the dissent. Well, remember when the judges were looking at how Oh, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, he said Bradley says that discrimination like may be a badge of slavery, but, uh, but uh, what what's you this? You can't you know, use this, uh, the slavery law to legislate discrimination. But, but the, um, the Harlan dissent doesn't say that. He said the badge of servitude. What Warren? Very good. I'll, I'll go on to Ava. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, in fact, yeah, there you go. John, thank you. John, what's this phrase that Harlan raises, right? Badges or incidents, they're called different things, but they're the same idea. Badges or incidents of slavery. What What? What does this mean, according to the dissent, at least? Um, <clears throat> You know, if you have a badge, right? You know, your Boy Scout, whatever, John. What is a badge? I'll get your Boy Scout. I was never a Boy Scout, right? Can't tie a knot for my life, right? So I always slip on shoes, right? John, why? It's true. Why? What are the? What's the point of a badge? What does that mean, a badge? What, why would someone have a badge on? To distinguish them from. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to add something. Remind. Remind. I think that's a good word. Do you all read in high school English a scarlet letter? Oh, God, it's bringing you back, right? <laughs> Hester Prynne, right, had the scarlet A for adulteress. And she was required to wear this letter, A, scarlet A, scarlet letter, to remind everyone that she was an adulteress, right? This phrase, bad, right? This phrase, bad, specifically references a reminder of slavery, a reminder of this racial inequality, a reminder of this white supremacy, right? Harlan reads the 14th, I'm sorry, the 13th Amendment as not merely ending the institution of chattel slavery, but eliminating and eradicating all of the reminders of that system. Because what happened after the Civil War? Okay, yes, the slaves were freed, but you had Jim Crow, and you had segregation laws, and you had laws depriving the right to vote, and you had laws depriving people of the right to access facilities, and they couldn't make contracts, and they couldn't sell property, and they couldn't um, uh, 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 sue in court, and you know, you can run down the list of, of various things, right? Couldn't bear arms, it's a long list. What Harlan says is that the 13th Amendment was not only about ending slavery, right, but eliminating the incidents, the vestiges, the reminders, Ava's word, reminders of that institution. And not only that, right, but Congress had the power through Section 2 of the 13th Amendment to enforce that legislation, that Congress had the power to eliminate those badges. That Congress, therefore, had the power to eliminate those incidents of slavery, right? It wasn't just you end slavery tomorrow and you call it a day, right? That wasn't re what Reconstruction was about. This was a long process, and it was under so Congress had to pass legislation. Again, it wasn't for the courts to promote equality. It was for Congress to pass laws that criminalize the reminders, right? So as these sort of segregation laws bubbled up, Congress passes the Civil Rights Act of 75, 
which says if you run a private business and you exclude people based on their race, you're a criminal, right? Is that a rational judgment for Congress to make that if you want to get rid of segregation, you throw the bums in jail? I don't know. That's a pretty good deterrent. I don't know. Maybe agree with me or not. You know, deterrence is a form of criminal law. But if you have the threat of criminal prosecution, maybe you're going to open up your restaurant. And one point I always like to make, let's say the civil rights, you know, Regina asked this question, was this case wrongly decided? I think the answer is yes, right? But let's say the case came out differently, right? And let's say starting in the 1870s, roughly 10 years after the Civil War completed, the federal government started throwing people in jail for having segregation. Do you think we would have gotten to the 1960s with segregation as rampant as it was? Or could it have maybe turned out differently? You know, an alternate history of the world. It's always, you know, who, who knows what would have happened? I couldn't tell you. But by the 1870s, Jim Crow was just getting its feet wet, right? The, the segregation law in Plessy, the, the train car, that was one of the first laws of its kind in the nation. What if civil rights case came out the other way, right? What if Plessy came out the other way in the 1870s and 1880s? you then would not have had an entire generation growing up with this institution. Now, I'll give the flip side. What if in the 1870s, 80s, the Supreme Court said, hey, Louisiana, desegregate. And Louisiana said, F off, right? No way. Screw you. We're not going to do it. Then what's happened to the court? People start ignoring the court. And that creates other problems. So I, I can't tell you. I don't like playing alternate history. It's really fun. Maybe go write a book of historical fiction, right? I, I couldn't. I, I, I try and I go back and forth in my head. I don't know the answer, but I want you to see both sides. I saw a question somewhere there, hand. Oh, yeah, Gabriel and then someone else at hand. Uh, then Damon, yeah. I think, um, I think the board was trying to slow down the process because after the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the fact that it was not just more slavery, but if they allow people to just pretty much do so anything, it would just be. Yeah, and again, it's not just civil lawsuits, it's criminal, right? Be very careful. The Civil Rights Act of 75 was, you go to jail for being a, a segregationist. It's a crime, a federal crime. I think they were just trying to slow down my... Yeah. I, I'm assuming that they saw that that could be a problem, but just opening the gate would be too much. So they, they maybe slow down the process to make it efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I wouldn't hear Gabriel's point, right? The court acknowledges that we don't want to be a censor of state legislation, right? Because once this, if civil rights case came out the other way, you'd have the federal courts overwhelmed with lawsuits by people saying that this place kept me out because my race, this case, you know, this restaurant kept me out. But also criminal. D don't forget, this was a criminal sanction, right? Not even Ollie's Barbecue in Hartsford Atlanta were criminal offenses. In the 1960s, they were civil offenses. Here, the Republicans in Congress were freaking serious. They said, if you are excluding people on the basis of race, you're going to jail. For a year, right? That's that's a really big, and there weren't many federal crimes back then. It wasn't like there are today. Everything's a federal crime. This was new, yes, sir, Damon. Uh, I feel like what was saying that uh, if, uh, if it was passed, uh, the gate was open. It was a matter of interpretation, like how you see this uh, uh, being treated differently, or uh, especially when it comes to the private. Very good. And and one related point, everyone, this wasn't just a southern thing, right? This may surprise you. This was the opera house in New York City, right? You don't think of New York City having sorts of laws, but it did. You also had uh, McGuire's in San Francisco, right? Again, you think of the South. This was pretty spread, pretty widely spread throughout the country. Yes, Clinton. Can I reframe? So you thought you think it was, it was uh, decided correctly based on a couple hundred years of history since then. But you, you think it was decided correctly on the basis of what the Constitution said at that time. I think in that time, kind of like when you talked about Dred Scott, you said, you know, was it just, was it at the at the right time? That makes sense. Yeah, no, I get your question. I think Harlan captures the Fourteenth Amendment better than than does the majority in the Thirteenth Amendment as well. If you look at the framers of the 13th Amendment, they would speak of badges and instances of slavery, right? Harlan didn't make this up of whole cloth. He was alive at the time, and he was tapping into some popular thought about that amendment. Okay, so how do you weigh that against the 1868? So when the 13th and 14th Amendment came out, was the same time. 1868 was when the first 
civil rights act came about 66 66 okay uh, in 1866, that was the same year that the 13th or the 14th Amendment was set up for ratification. It took two years to ratify, so it came out in 1868. So it almost verbatim matches. You see where the, my disconnect is? Well, but but it doesn't, though. We discussed this last week. The 14th Amendment doesn't speak of race. The Civil Rights Act of 66 does, right? But Harlan here isn't talking about the 14th Amendment. He gets there, but he's only in the 13th Amendment, right? The key question is, does this phrase slavery and involuntary servitude refer only to chattel slavery, or does it extend to the institution of slavery, any of the badges or incidents, the reminders thereof? That, that's the question. Harlan doesn't need the 14th Amendment to get the civil rights case. He doesn't need it. He can rely entirely on the 13th Amendment. He doesn't have to, but, he, but he, that, that, that's the thing. There's a question, why does Harlan like the 13th Amendment more? Because it doesn't limit the state action, it's broad. I would read the opinion with that in mind. You don't have to, but, you can, but I'm glad you went. I, would read it. I read it every semester, it always gets better. I, I always see different things. Every semester, whenever I read them, I always see different things pop out. So I read it again, see what else happens, right? Now, so Harlan, the first part of his opinion focuses on the 13th Amendment, right? But he then goes on to the 14th Amendment. And he disagrees with the majority on the state action doctrine. This part, I think Harlan's on shakier footing. I, as I said, I mostly agree with Harlan. I think his 13th Amendment analysis is pretty good. I would read the 13th Amendment much more broadly than, than does the court. But, uh, oh God, where am I? Uh, uh, Gabriel, why does Harlan think that the 14th Amendment's not limited to state action? Okay, so which provision of the 14th Amendment does Harlan have to rely on here? Well, well, I mean, Section 5 for sure, but which part of Section 1 does he rely on? Very important. Yeah. What does Harlan, just finish up, Gabriel, what does Harlan say about citizenship? Yeah, there it is. Okay, very good. Everyone heard what Gabriel said. If you look at Section 1, Sentence 1 of the 14th Amendment, says all persons born or naturalized are citizens of the United States. And Harlan says this word citizens means something. It means you get certain rights that no one can deprive you of. That is, to exclude a person from a restaurant because of their skin color is to deny them their citizenship. And that Congress has the power to criminalize pursuant to Section 5. Everyone see that, right? Harlan says that they have the power under the Citizenship Clause. So he basically ducks all these other provisions, right? What would you just say? No state, no state, no state. Section 1 doesn't have that limitation. This part, I think, is probably wrong. I, 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 Harlan, I think, tries to get a little cute here. Um, I'll go with his 13th Amendment. I don't go with his 14th, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. What do I know? He, he was alive at the time. I wasn't there. But he does rely on the citizenship clause to say that there is not a state action restriction. Okay. Yeah, Warren. I think one of the reasons that that's kind of a shaky argument is that given the state court cases that have been supported, he said that citizenship is not a requirement for being able to to go into the the restaurant or the the theater. They they you know they can serve yeah. like Ah, so if the state, so you're saying if the state permits segregation, that's state action. I think so. So the state was actually required to prohibit it. Is that your your, your argument? It, well, under the Fourteenth Amendment, there would be. Uh, I, I would argue that it would, uh, like be required to keep them from discriminating. So states have an affirmative duty to pass civil rights laws. 
to prevent discrimination. And the failure to do that makes it unconstitutional. Ah, so let, let, what Warren's on to is actually an important point. I asked this question earlier, what does protection mean? Protection from racism? Protection from segregation? There are a lot of scholars, I don't know if I'm one of them, but I'll give it to you, who think this phrase, denying the equal protection of the laws, is exactly what Warren said it is. That the states have to make sure that its own citizens are not being discriminated against. That's what protection means, right? Protection from the Ku Klux Klan, for example. Protection from segregation. So if that reading of equal protection works, then states would have an affirmative duty to ensure that there's no segregation in their states. That is not the prevailing view, but that is a view that some people advance. Trey? Yes, he says it extends beyond, that's right. So Harlan would say that the 14th Amendment, even if Congress doesn't act, still imposes obligation on the states. The key point, though, is these people being prosecuted under the Civil Rights Act of 75, right? These cases were not about the 14th Amendment standing by itself, just Section 1. But you're right, Trey. So again, let me, let me summarize for you guys a little bit. Harlan thinks that the 13th Amendment is broad. It's not just about slavery. It's about these incidents and badges of slavery, these reminders of slavery, right? You can't just free people from a plantation and expect them to be like, you know, to jump to the line. You got you to process them in. So Congress has the power to facilitate that. With the 14th Amendment, he gets around the state action doctrine by looking at the citizenship clause and maybe even equal protection clause, as Warren mentioned. But in any event, he would read Section 5 broadly. Brian said necessary and proper. He would basically give McCulloch and Maryland treatment to Section 5, give a very permissive, elastic reading of the provision. JC? Uh, what I kind of jumped the gun to earlier. Yeah, yeah, commerce. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go for it. Yeah. He kind of laid a groundwork oh, for it. That was, my next, that was my very next question. You're, so, you're, 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 you're reading my mind. Yeah. Yeah, just go for it, JC. Tell us. Yeah. He makes the argument, he uh, talks about the function of public roads, uh, how they might be privately owned. Yeah. Uh, he even goes on to talk about innkeepers, how they cannot deny someone a community to stay. Uh, use of water, <laughs> he talks about all these things that are public or privately owned, but how those private entities should not be able to deny people uh, use of their facilities. Very good, very good, very good. Everyone heard what he said, okay? We know now in hindsight that in the 1960s the court would uphold civil rights laws on the basis of the Commerce Clause, right? This is Hartsville at the Motel, all these barbecue cats and back in the clung, right? We know that now, 50, you know, 100 years after this case. Harlan didn't know that then, but Harlan was a very insightful person. Um, there was a little footnote about him, a little, little, little block. He actually taught um, constitutional law at George Washington, which was today is George Washington Law School. And he was remarkable. He would lecture for two hours on end without notes. I can't do that. And he would actually teach the Constitution by clause. There weren't many cases back then. He would start with preamble, section one, two, three. He would go in order of the Constitution. And for a project, I actually um, uh, had all of his lecture notes transcribed. One of his students was taking shorthand and, and wrote the entire uh, lecture notes. So I had them typed up. Um, and he, in his lessons, was very um, forward thinking about the Commerce Clause. And he would tell his students in the 1890s, you know, there's this clause called the Commerce Clause, right? It hasn't really done much yet, but this will be the basis for the Industrial Revolution. This will be the basis for how our economy functions in the next century. And he'd be very honest about this. He'd say, look, we have this clause, this commerce. We have this expanding economic engine. This is where federal power will come from. So here, JC says, look, he, says, uh, he said it in his dissent in Harlan. Uh, there's commerce, right? There are roads, right? Someone bought a ticket from this state to that state, right? You have travelers. Why is entering places of business not interstate commerce? The court wasn't even close to this, right? They wouldn't hit that for decades. But Harlan, again, his dissents were very forward-thinking. He knew 
he knew what was going on, which is why I'm a, I'm a huge Harlan fan. I think he was one of the uh, my top five justices of all time. I think. Up there, maybe top five, maybe top ten, definitely top five. So, any other questions on the Harlan descent in um, in the civil rights cases? Okay. Oh yeah, Brian, go ahead, please. I like him in spite of that. Yeah, so his name is John Marshall Harlan and was actually named after Chief Justice John Marshall. Uh, I like him in spite of his name. I, I prefer John Marshall Harlan far more than John Marshall. Uh, as it turns out, John Marshall Harlan's grandson was also a Supreme Court Justice. So you have John Marshall Harlan the first and John Marshall Harlan the second. I don't like the second one nearly as much. He was whatever. But the first one was good. Fascinating guy. I mean, I, I, you don't know a person until you read their lecture notes, and you know, I can relate to that now. Uh, but he, he would just teach, and he'd have such passion. He had this one lecture where he'd tell his students, you know, so many people graduate law school and never read the Constitution. You should read the entire thing. Did I tell you that in the first day of class? I saw it from Harlan. Yeah, I mean, you don't even know this, but I incorporate his stuff into my lessons. Uh, you, you'll never know, but I do. Um, but he would just have such a good way of explaining things. The funniest part, though, is that he would sometimes tell his kid, you know, there's this case pending. I can't tell what's going to happen, but let me tell you what's going to happen. So he basically told his students the outcome of the case, and the, and the lectures were dated. So then I checked, like, a week later, the case came out. Ah, he, he announced his dissent in advance. And he would always say, but I was in dissent, so I must be wrong. Right? He says, I was in dissent, so I must be wrong, which is just like a really passive-aggressive way of saying, ah, they were wrong. But uh, uh, he, uh, he was a wonderful judge. Um, yeah, he would... He would uh, he would be on the court five days a week. They don't have law clerks back then. He would then teach. I think it was he would teach at law school Saturday night to basically uh, evening students who have full time jobs, and then Sunday morning he would teach at a Sunday school uh, uh, nearby. So he had a very very busy schedule. In fact, there's a hilarious story where when he was teaching, the university tried lowering his salary. There's this letter that the dean sent saying, "Yeah, we need to hire this new secretary. We're going to lower your salary to pay for the secretary." Can you imagine, right? A justice in the Supreme Court teaching constitutional law at your law school and you lowball the guy's salary to pay for a secretary and he got livid he actually threatened to resign and ultimately he did uh but 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 really fascinating guy but re re really really important figure in our history yeah Rita. who do you think of the, of the justices right now have the best defense well unfortunately justice Scalia is no longer with us um uh in terms of dissent i'm a kagan fan i think she, she can write pretty well uh, my, the top two writers right now are Kagan and uh, uh, Roberts, by by far. Not my favorites, but I think the best writers in the court. Scalia had them all beat, but he's not writing anymore, unfortunately. All right, anything else on the on civil rights cases? Okay. Uh, who am I up to? Yeah, Kobe. I mean, we already did Yikwo, but just give me the facts. We'll, we'll we'll go through it again a little bit, a little more carefully. Yeah. Um... The city of San Francisco required all laundries and have passed up a lease ordinance requiring all laundries and buildings to hold a permit uh, issued by the Board of Supervisors. Okay. Uh, all of the 95% of the laundries, um, 95% of the laundries were wind building, and then um, when it came down, it received a permit. Every um, Asian Chinese owned um, laundry did not receive a permit. Okay, very good. Um, the facts of this case, again, are a little bit complicated, right? So, first off, the guy's name wasn't even Yik Wo. It was Lee Yik, and, you know, whatever. They, they can't even get the guy's name right. Um, but his name was Lee Yik. I'll just call him Yik to make it easier uh, or simpler. Um, Yik was one of many people in the San Francisco area who was of Chinese descent and had a laundry business. This was a very lucrative business for immigrants because it didn't require a lot of capital. If you had a basically a boiling pot of water, you can clean clothes. It didn't require you to invest in a lot of equipment. So this was a very um, common career for immigrants. Now, let's walk through the 14th Amendment, right? The court makes it very clear that these people are not citizens. They call them the emperor of the subject of China, right? Notice they say that. The reason why they say that is for that thing that they can't be subject to our jurisdiction. Even if Yik had a kid who was born here, at the time the court may not have considered him subject to our jurisdiction. This even came up in, in Korematsu, right? Four or five decades later, said, well, these people have loyalties to the Emperor of Japan. You notice they wrote that, right? 
And look at Harlan's dissent also in Plessy, we'll do in a few minutes. There was a very distinct <coughs> nativist thread that people of Chinese or Japanese descent could not be citizens of the United States because they were always loyal to their emperor, right? There was this very distinct thread which comes up here. So, Yik was not a citizen. He could not rely then on the privileges or immunities clause. Not that it meant anything, but he couldn't rely on it. But then we get to these other clauses, three and four. It doesn't apply to citizens. It applies to persons. And without a doubt, Yik was a person. He was a human being. Okay. What complicates this a little bit further is that there was a treaty involved. Right? The relevance of this treaty, law professors debate about. But there was a treaty involved that basically said that, um, uh, you know, between the U.S. and China that said the states can't punish, you know, a, a subject of China. That plays a role. I don't want to talk about it too much. But then we actually get to the law itself, and we discussed this earlier. People were being denied licenses from these laundromats, not because of any health or safety concerns, but, because, but based on an arbitrary and random standard. There was no standard. It was completely random. Right? So, Trey, let's try this again now that we've done civil rights cases. What exactly was the basis of the court's ruling in Yikwo? Trey, you said this phrase, evil eye and uneven hand. What was that was that was that phrase being Trey? What's an evil eye? What the hell is that? Oh, he's good. See, you have a priest in the class who knows this stuff. Yeah. And another phrase, uh, evil eye. I swear, if you want to ask something about the Old Testament, ask a priest. They know much better than we do. Um, what's this phrase, evil eye? Uh, don't... Yeah, there's this phrase. Uh, it is in Jewish mysticism, but, but generally, you have, you, have a, you have a wicked intent, a mens rea, you might say, right? Jealousy, Abdul says, maybe others. Um, but you have a motivation that's not present on the face of the statute. Yik Wo is often cited for this principle, that even with a facially neutral law, right, with a facially neutral law, courts can intervene if it's being applied in an unfair fashion, right? The law itself on its face says nothing about Chinese people, it says nothing about Asians, it says you have to apply for a permit. But it's being applied with an uneven hand. That means it's being applied unfairly. Okay? And why is it being applied unfairly? Well, this is where the evil eye comes in. Racism, right? A disfavor of Chinese immigrants. Okay? So even the law on its face is neutral. The court looks behind the curtain. Like, you ever see the Wizard of Oz, right? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? That's what we have. You have this great big wizard. You know, everything looks awesome. But then you peel back the curtain, you have this little dude there with a little machine. You're running with a little whatever, right? Um, that's how I like to think about it, right? When can courts peel back the curtain, right? When can courts look behind the face of a neutral law? And the court says, here, we'll do this because there's application unevenly. It's being applied unevenly. And they say there's, there's this wicked eye. Okay. But, uh, I can't see your name. Sorry. Uh, Matt, why does this law have a wicked eye? What about it is wicked? Is it the racism that makes it wicked or is it something else? It's the law itself. It's just the way it's being carried out. Be more precise. What about this law makes it wicked or evil? Is, is that what makes it wicked? Perhaps the motivations for it. What makes the law wicked, Scott? Uh, what makes it evil? 
Is it that it's targeting it's Chinese it's people? Which is, but it, it uh, sets the stage where somebody that enforces the word use it for that purpose. So but what about it makes it evil? What about the way it's being, what about the way the permit's being processed makes it evil? That's the question, right? And I think we start, it's not because of the effect on Chinese people. That matters. That, that's not the reason. Thank you, Mr. Noda. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. It's completely arbitrary, right? Kimmy said it right. It's completely arbitrary. What makes this evil? Again, people love reading this today and say, "Ah, the evil eye." It's looking at racism. Maybe it was. Probably not. But what they were really concerned about, I think, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, is that it was enforced in, completely, in a completely arbitrary and random fashion, right? That. The will of the sheriff, or the will of whoever is applying the permit, can decide, you get it, you know, you get it, you don't get it, you don't get it. And that is what's problematic. Now, the fact that it disproportionately affects Chinese people, I think, gave them the sense that it was an uneven application, right? But that, I don't think, was the basis for its invalidation. I saw a few hands. Can you raise your hand up? Yeah, do you think, um, because of the of birth the license Gabriel, let me give you another one. What percentage in Plessy of black customers could ride the white car train? <clears throat> Zero. Right? In other words, if Yik Wo actually stood for that proposition, then Plessy should come out the other way. Right? And here's the rub, right? It's easy to say that Plessy was inconsistent with Yik Wo, that they may be cared for Asian people but didn't like black people. I don't think it's even factually accurate. I think the better way to reconcile Yik Wo and Plessy is that Yik Wo was not about race. It was about violating an economic property right in an arbitrary fashion. I think if you read Yik Wo in that way, it fits in the narrative, right? It fits in the canon, or the anti canon I suppose, but it fits in the sequence, right? You can see Yik Wo as the outlier. That's like, oh my God, they protected racial equality, then they forgot about it a couple years later in Plessy. You can do that. Or you can just say, Plessy was about racial equality, and Yik Wo was about economic freedom. That it was being a license was being denied to earn livelihood because of arbitrariness. I, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, again, there's, there's a debate about this. Not everyone agrees with me. I, I want to be very clear. Uh, this, one, this one I'm saying to TV next week, so people will yell at me. But uh, thank you, caller, right? You know. Uh, God, the people who call it the seats kind of 10 o'clock at night on a Monday. I, Lord help me. Uh, but I think, Gabriel, the point is this, right? If Yik Wo actually stood for that proposition, then Plessy should come out the other way. Yeah, it, point. yeah you see your point? Yeah, yeah, Abdul, and then, and then Matt? When I remember, like, the majority, if not almost everybody, wasn't Asian, it wasn't Chinese, that's what That's right. It's hard to argue that it's probably well, it was based on race, there's no question, but the reason why they struck it down was because it was random, right? There wasn't any basis, right? There, there was no standard saying, you get a permit if you do X, Y, and Z. It was completely arbitrary. So again, I think the racial thing goes to whether it was an uneven hand. It wasn't being applied evenly, but that was a reflection of the fact that it was random and arbitrary, right? You, you, you can read, okay, I don't, you can read Yik Wo that way, right? But if you do, how do you reconcile Yik Wo and Plessy? It gets really hard. When I say random, I don't mean like pulling cards out of a hat, right? I mean it was arbitrary in the fact that there was no actual standard. It was pure about favoritism and racism, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sorry. When I say random, it's not like pick, pick a number of a hat, right? Where this one gets it, this one gets it. But here, when I say random, there was no standard to apply. Uh, Matt and then someone else? Okay, good. I'm glad you guys are this. Yeah, Clinton. Like, I thought I read this somewhere, and I, I don't remember where, and if, if I'm wrong, maybe. So they denied, all of the people that were denied were of Chinese descent, right. they were not citizens, right? I don't know if that was in the record, but I'm assuming most of them weren't. The way I read it, uh, and I don't know, but I do a lot of our Google when I'm looking at things, was that none of, this, none of them were citizens, so this was a disparity. That's a, that the reason that we talked about the latter part of the 14th Amendment, but it wasn't talking about citizens, it was saying that you could apply 
the Fourteenth Amendment to anyone who comes to our nation, yes, including immigrants, illegal immigrants. I went. I read an article last night about illegal immigrants and how the Fourteenth Amendment applies it to does. illegal immigrants and anyone who's arrested. And they were talking about Arizona and so forth and how they can't stop people from going in jail even if they're not citizens. The question of how the Constitution applies to non-citizens is very tough. Yeah. Um, for example, if a person who's not a citizen gets pulled over, they're required to have Miranda warnings, for example, right? They're required to get a lawyer. If a person who's not a citizen tries to make a contribution to a political campaign, they'll be a felon, right? This is, if a person who's not a citizen tries to acquire a firearm, they'll be a felon. So the rights do not apply consistently to people who are not citizens. It, it, it's a very murky area of law. But what this court says is, Persons, right, the 14th Amendment, they can't be deprived of his liberty interests. Again, very murky area. Very murky area. Right, so again, Yikwo, okay, so let, let me try it like this, right? There are a couple ways of reading it. The, the, the way that modern courts read Yikwo is that this was a case about racial discrimination and that the evil eye was racism and that because this law targeted Chinese people with this ethnicity, it was unconstitutional. You can read it that way. I don't think it's the best reading. I think the better reading is the fact that this only uh, uh, harmed Chinese people was, was evidence of it being applied unequally. And that the real reason Yik Wo or Li Yik got freed from prison is that it was a completely arbitrary standard that was not comporting with due process of law. I think the second reading is probably better, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to fight you over it. I think I think both of them are plausible. With that, that though, the, the first reading is how courts today consider Yikwo, right? We look at Brown, we look at say, oh look, Yikwo, evil eye, right? But if that's what the court was doing, then Plessy could not have come out the way it was, right? You can't go from that to Plessy. It was only a couple years difference, right? It wasn't that long, right? You can't go from Yikwo to Plessy and say, so, oh, they forgot. Right, or, you know, they, they changed their minds. This was a unanimous equal decision, and then eight to one the other way in um, uh, uh, Plessy. Yeah, Judge. So if um, Plessy, it was clearly up to the train officials to place people randomly, and then it just ha so happened that they. Oh, it wasn't random. No, they, they had a standard. I know what I'm saying. Yeah. In the practice, you say on race, if, if the train drivers place it on race, then that would yeah. be more like. Yeah, actually, let, let me take, let me, let me use judge's question transition. The statute in, in uh, a Yik Wo was neutral, right? The statute says nothing about race. The law in Plessy, was that race neutral on its face? No. The law on its face involved race. You don't even need to get to an evil eye. It says on the, on the face of the damn statute, right? It says it on the statute. Black's here, white's there. It says it on the, on the, on the damn statute. So again, if Yik Wo meant you can't have an evil eye, then without question, Plessy should have been 9-0 in favor of Mr. Mr. Plessy. No question. It was 8-1 the other way. All right, so let's go on to the next one. Um, uh, uh, Michelle, I'll call you in a minute for, for Plessy. Um, we do not have any pictures of Homer Plessy. Um, there are some pictures of him floating the internet. I can't verify them, but you know, I, they're probably not real. I, nothing in the internet is real. Um, here's his grave, whatever, whatever that's worth. Uh, there's some various plaques for him. Uh, I did find a copy of his birth certificate from Orleans Parish. Um, we do have pictures of Judge Ferguson. Okay. Uh, uh, now, why, why was the case called Plessy versus Ferguson, right? Why was Plessy suing a judge? It's, I don't even fully understand it, but it's a weird wrinkle of Louisiana law where when you're challenging your conviction, you actually sue the judge. It's a weird thing. Don't, don't, get, don't get too bent out of shape about it. Um, but this is Judge Ferguson. Um, I actually found his obituary in the Times-Picayune. Um, you'd think the most famous, one well, of the top five most famous cases of all time would be mentioned, right? It's not mentioned as a bitch word anyway, right? This is a, so I guess it wasn't that important at the time. Um, let me read this for you, okay? This is a um, newspaper account from 1892 when Homer Plessy got arrested. And the headline, I'll show you the headline in a minute. It says, 
in the wrong coach. A snuff color descent of ham. This is want this reference tray? Yeah. So uh, this, what's the story? Noah had a dark colored son who became ham. I mean that that anyway. So a snuff colored descent of ham kicks against a Jim Crow. Okay, and I'll, I'll read you just just part of it. It's long. So yesterday afternoon at four fifteen. A detective arrested from the East Louisiana Railroad, Homer Plessy, a light mulatto, and locked him up, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Okay, so here, here, here's what happens, right? Captain Kane, uh, Kane, speaking of the circumstances, say that he and the conductor ordered both the man from the white coach as the one set apart for the colored people. The Negro refused to leave the coach, saying that he had bought his ticket and was going to ride to Covington, which is an in-state travel. Captain Kane told him he would either have to retire to their coach or go to jail. To which he responded, he would sooner go to jail than leave the car. Okay? The conductor asked, are you a colored man? Yes, was the answer. Then you have to retire. He refused. Then they arrested him. Okay? This is what we call a test case. I've used this phrase a few times, right? Homer Plessy went there to get arrested. Okay? He wanted to get arrested to challenge this law. Uh, and in fact, I um, actually found the, uh, the, the bond order. The judge set the bond at $500, which is a very big amount. I mean, someone could do the math. That, that was a lot of money back then. Uh, he posted bond pretty quickly, which means someone was standing by to post bond for him. Right? You know, that, 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 that's what was going on here. And this is the case of his prosecution. Uh, and he signed an affidavit. He refused. Okay. Uh, it is actually rep represented by this guy, by Albion Trage, pardon my French, uh, uh, but he was going to argue the case before the Supreme Court. Now, Plessy himself was only one-eighth black. Apparently, he was fairly light-skinned. But they wanted this guy to be the plaintiff to, to show that even someone who's phenotypically white, because he admitted he was black, would be excluded from this, from this rail car. Okay? So everyone gets the facts, right? All right, Michelle, walk me through the, the majority, Justice Brown's analysis, please. He says that um, a statute to imply a legal equality or inequality? Equality. Okay, good. So what does that mean? What does that mean that this statute doesn't actually change the equality of the races? What, 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 what's, what's the court getting at here? Um, I feel like it's more dealing with the social aspect of it, that the statute doesn't... Ah, okay. Michelle, let me ask you a follow-up. According to the majority, what's the source of racial equality? Is it this law? based on the social aspect of it. Very good. So the court basically says here that, and this is, I think, one of the more disparaging sentences in the entire opinion, this law doesn't impose inequality. And to the extent that you think it does, that's your problem, right? If you feel that this law putting one train car for white people, one for train for black people, if that's imposing inequality, that's your fault, right? Any differences in the races is due to social conditions, right? They refer to whites as superior. They say this in a fairly blatant sense. It's not like, you know, sugar-coated at all, right? So because this idea of racial equality is something for social, for society to develop, that this law does not run afoul of this distinction. And the court says, this is distinction which is found in the color of the two races and which must always exist so long as white men are distinguished from the other race by color. Again, you can't read this and then get Guo is consistent with it. I, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it, it's hard to read this only a couple years later. I think this is follows naturally from Yikwo. Okay? So they look at the 13th Amendment, right? The 13th Amendment was already narrowed in civil rights cases. It said, nope, slavery means slavery. It doesn't mean the badges or incidents of slavery means slavery. So they already reject the 13th Amendment. But then they go to the 14th Amendment, right? Here we have actually a state law, a Louisiana law. This wasn't a private business. 
that's sought to exclude right that's sought to exclude the um, uh, um, uh, uh, black customers from their train from their train car this was a state law right so Samuel how does the court then grapple the fact that we have state action there is a state law why is this not a violation of the 14th Amendment Good. Yeah. Very good. The majority says that this law, this Louisiana statute, is an exercise of the police power, right? That the state has the power to make uh, uh, a reasonable regulations and health and safety for the public good. Okay. And this is one of the more bizarre aspects of the opinion. The court says that this is a reasonable law. Now, let me let me uh, let, let, let me dive deeper on this one for a minute. Cameron, what do you think would have happened in New Orleans in the nine, I'm sorry, New Orleans in the 1890s if the train cars were integrated? What do you think might have happened to a person like Homer Plessy if he hopped into the uh, other car? What was going on in the South in the 1880s and 90s? Um, no, 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 it was not. Maybe it's if he's in there by himself. Yeah. That might not be well. Lynched, right, I, I'll say. There was an actual argument advanced in courts that these laws were designed for the protection of the black people. Just, just, just hang with me for one second. I'm not, not endorsing. These are arguments, right? that if you actually had the mixing of the races, there would be such violence on the train cars that society would, would, would have strife. So that's just actually for Homer's protection that he had this. You want to talk about equal protection of the laws? They argue this was protecting them. These are actually the same arguments for segregated schools and everything else, right? So Louisiana said, look, this is our police power. We're trying to promote racial stability, right? Now you say, wait a minute, Josh, that, that's insane. You're, you're promoting superiority and inferiority. This is not equal train cars. It's, in, it's instilling in the people that these are distinctions. But the court here agrees with that. They say that this is within the police power. This is no different than requiring separate schools for black children, which District of Columbia did. And that's an important fact. Say, at the time the 14th Amendment was ratified, public schools in D.C. were segregated. You will read this next week or after spring break in Brown, where the court says, you know, the 14th Amendment, we want to look at history, but eh, Congress had segregated schools. What does that say about the 14th Amendment? We'll talk about that later next week also. But they adopt this doctrine, which was very famous, which is the doctrine of separate but equal, right? That so long as the facilities for the races are of equal stature, they can be separate. And this is within the police power of the state. And they make this argument that integration must be voluntary. Integration cannot be forced. Right? They say social prejudices cannot be overcome by legislation. You can't secure equal rights by requiring them to commingle. There's a very famous quote. If the two races are to meet upon terms of social inequality, I'm sorry, if the two races are to meet on terms of social equality, it must be the result of natural affinities, a mutual appreciation of each other's merits, and a voluntary consent of individuals. Legislation, the court writes, cannot eradicate racial instincts or abolish distinctions based on physical differences. If one race is socially inferior, the Constitution cannot put them on the same plane. So what they're basically saying is, if there's racial inequality, it's natural. It's not because of anything that is done by the government. And the Constitution has no role. What this is basically saying is that Section 5 is worthless. 
right? This wasn't a Section 5 case, but it affects it. If Sections 1 through 4 have no real meaning, right? Again, slaughterhouse killed the Privileges or Immunities Clause, right? The Civil Rights case has killed Section 5. This case basically kills due process and equal protection. That the provisions of the 14th Amendment, which were ratified after a bloody civil war, have now been reduced to nothing. Nothing. I mean, it, it, there's, there's not much left to the 14th Amendment after these three or four cases we've studied last week and this week. You're not much different than you were with Dred Scott. You have no slavery, for sure. Slavery as an institution is gone. But the vestiges, the incidents, the badges, the reminders of it, those would persist for decade upon decade until you get to the 1950s or 60s, really. It would, it would take quite that long. So any questions about the majority in uh, Plessy? I just, I'm trying to wrap my mind around the underlying justification you said about it being reasonable because if they didn't like, enforce the segregation, it would uh, lead to, to violence. And to me, this just sounds like, well, if we don't do this, people are going to break the law. So instead of you know, throwing them in jail and making them go to court for the, them breaking the law, because we know they will break the law, we're just not going to make it. Yeah, yeah. so everyone, understand, everyone get Witt's question, right? Witt says, wait a minute. If, if you have these white people who start lynching the black train customers, why are we punishing the black train customers instead of like punching the lynchers, right? This is an argument that's often called the heckler's veto. Right, you'll hear about this, right? So let's say a very controversial speaker comes to campus, right? And students who don't want to hear that speaker say, we're going to threaten violence. And we're going to start looting and rioting. And the school says, oh, no, we don't want violence. Let's cancel the speaker from coming here. That way, okay. Once you do that once, the hecklers know they can use it again. And they can use the same threat of violence. So what Witt's arguing is actually a fairly common mode, right? That to avoid violence, you punish the right of the person who will be violenced against, right? To be harmed. You're, you're exactly right. It's a good point. Uh, yeah, Brian, and then Damon. Oh, you mean why doesn't the court address the Civil Rights Act of 1875? Did the Civil Rights Act of 1875 say? that you can't discriminate on public conveyances on land on the basis of race? Didn't it say that? That could blow your mind. Brian, what did the court do to the Civil Rights Act of 1875 in the slaughterhouse cases? I'm sorry, the Civil Rights cases? In all of its respects? This is a point which maybe five people in the world understand. It's actually, I read it recently. I was, my mind was blown. My, my former professor, Jonathan Mitchell, who was one of the smartest guys in the world, wrote this. I was like, wow. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 was at issue in the civil rights cases. What the court said is, as applied to private businesses, the law is unconstitutional. But the court did not invalidate as applied to the state. So Plessy screwed up bigly. They really screwed up. Because the Civil Rights Act of 1875 still bound Louisiana. Even if Congress couldn't legislate against private individuals, they still had the Civil Rights Act of 75 against Louisiana. And that would prohibit it, John, Judge Ferguson, from enforcing this law. So this was a total screw up, right? There are a lot of reasons why this case is wrong, but this is another one, right? Congress still had legislation on the books to prohibit racial discrimination in the railways, and the court base ignored it. That makes sense, Brian? Again, I read this like last night with prepping for class, like, oh, oh my god, that's right. Uh, I, I, every, every year is a little bit different. Yeah, Ashley. Oh, um, a property interest. What do you, give, give me a little bit more to develop that. So he argues that, I guess, his being seven white is property, but then the court says that, well, if that's your property, then you're going to have to, it's considered a tort and not necessarily like a violation of your rights. Yeah, I, I wouldn't focus too much on that argument. Okay. What, what the court's basically saying is that 
there's not a liberty interest to get in a train. Again, with Yikwo, there was a property interest in running a business, but there's no liberty interest in running a train, so I don't think due process even applies. But your, 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 your heritage is your property, or I, I wouldn't waste much time on that. But it, it's, a weird, it's a weird argument. I, 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 let's do Harlan. We have 10 minutes left. Okay, who am I up to? Uh, Kendall. Give me Justice Harlan's dissent. Again, eight to one vote, same vote as in civil rights cases. What's Harlan's dissent here? Under which provision of the Constitution is it unconstitutional? Does he really say? Yeah, it's a little fuzzy. Yeah, I have my notes the same. I don't really know which provision it's under. Probably 14th Amendment for sure. Probably 13th, but it's a little fuzzy. But uh, Kendall, just finish it up. Why does Harlan think that the separate but equal doctrine is not? But look, he coins the phrase separate but equal. It doesn't really come from the majority, but he he he, he does it. Why does Ken, uh, Kendall does uh, Harlan think the separate equal doesn't doesn't hold? Yeah, very good, very good. So Harlan's opinion, right? Right? Harlan's opinion is premised on the idea that you can't have separate but equal. And he refers to the Constitution as colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. All citizens are equal before the law. So, uh, uh, Greg, what does that mean, a colorblind constitution? How does, how's Harlan using it? So according to Harlan, can the, can the government ever consider race in making decisions? Okay. So I'll ask the same question again in about a month. What about affirmative action? Uh-oh. Yeah. So this phrase, colorblind constitution, sounds great, but people, they don't like it very much. Because there are a lot of places in our laws where race is affirmatively, that's affirmative action means, affirmative, where race is affirmatively used for the benefit, they argue, of various racial minorities. So Harlan's opinion you'll see is actually cited today by conservatives who oppose affirmative action. You'll, you'll get that when you do the Fisher case at UT Austin. Um, but Harlan says our constitution is colorblind and can't tolerate these sorts of classes. Um, questions on that? Yeah, Stephanie. Um, when I was in Oh, is it about a uh, criminal background? Is that yeah. So it's like removing the, you know, the criminal history in the box from all the applications. But it was designed to try to get more of you know, people out of prison to get the job so they can have the option to go to prison. But it's having an unintended effect on like discriminating against black and Hispanic folks. So they're actually getting fewer jobs because of it. Um, so I guess the motivation behind it wasn't, I mean, it was supposed to be good, but the, the unintended effect of having to discriminate against a group of people for some reason does, I guess, would Bucky, is, not Bucky, would uh, Yick's flow like extend to that, like it's having an unintended effect? Uh, I only have a, if you ask me after class, I have a few minutes left. I gotta get through this stuff. But I promise we'll talk after class. I promise. Okay. Um, so Harlan's opinion, right? Harlan's opinion understands how bad this case is. He says this is gonna be like Dred Scott, right? Again, he's very he knows that in decades, 
they're going to look back and say this was this was a mistake. And he writes, this opinion will stimulate aggressions and encourage belief that by state laws, right, these people are inferior. This is a point I made earlier. By ruling in Plessy the way they did, the court gave its blessing, right, to, to Jim Crow. So go ahead. And that created generation, excuse me, upon generation of people who think segregation is normal, right? Segregation wasn't as bad in the 19, sorry, 1890s as it was decades later. It actually got worse. Because when the courts uphold these things, it was, oh yeah, we'll go out and do more and more and more and more. Um, so this actually made things significantly worse. And then Harlan makes a much broader point about the 14th Amendment, right? We fought a bloody civil war and ratified these amendments. For what purpose, right? By the time we get to Plessy, the 14th Amendment didn't mean anything. It had almost zero effect. You had Yick Wo, maybe. You had maybe one or two other cases. But the 14th Amendment was a dead letter. He was like, how can we have fought a civil war and ratified these amendments and had Reconstruction for nothing? That Congress is disabled. They can't enact the Civil Rights Act. We can't have uh, 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 integrated train cars, right? For what purpose? Okay. But at the very end, right, and I, I always have to mention this point, Harlan gets to Chinese people. And it's like, whoa, where the hell did this come from, right? It, 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 comes out, it comes out of left field, really, it does, right? But he writes, there is a race so different from our own that we do, not, we do not permit those belonging to it to become citizens of the United States. Persons belonging to it are, with few exceptions, absolutely excluded from our country, I allude to the Chinese race. Um, I read this, is that much different than how Tawny described people of African descent in Dred Scott? Or how Chief Justice Marshall described Indians in Johnson versus McIntosh. Again, it's funny. I always get these phone calls about Roger Tony. I'm like, look at Harlan, right? I like Harlan, but this is one not not so not so crazy about. He talked about Asian people in his lectures a lot. So I have a lot of the, his personal comments, which are not in the court. He said the exact same thing, right? You know, sometimes you say one thing to your students, nothing in the Supreme Court. He said the exact same thing, and he would tell his students that because of their loyalty to the Emperor of China, they are distinct people and they can never be integrated which is why they're never subject to our jurisdiction under the 14th Amendment. But he makes this point, even if a, quote, Chinaman can ride in the same passenger as white citizens, then why can't black people, right? In other words, if we let Chinese people ride in these train cars, why can't we let Homer Plessy do it? I mean, that's his argument. Like, even someone as lowly as a Chinese person, if he's allowed to, why not Homer Plessy? And that's why he brings this in. It's a rhetorical thing. He thought this was persuasive, right? He thought this actually made a compelling argument. Uh, but, you know, not every case book includes the very bit at the end, but kind of, I made sure our book includes it. All right, so questions then on Homer uh, Plessy and Ferguson. Yeah, Cliff. I, again, I'm going to disagree with what your analysis was. You're so welcome the to. The, the Chinaman thing, I think the reason you said that is that they weren't thinking. The first one. So you think they have even more rights as citizens? Yeah, they have more rights as citizens. I don't think this is a racially, I don't think this is a racially motivated comment. But Clint, one well, second, I have a minute left, but Clint, there's no reference to citizens in these two clauses, though. So. Yeah, but in the top, the privileges and immunity. But that's not relevant here, that's Slaughterhouse. It's out. What, what I'm saying is the reason that you talked about China is it was not racially motivated, was because these people were... But they were still given equal protection of the laws. That, that's the equal. They were still given due process of law. Yeah, but I, I'm not debating. We'll, we'll, we'll cut the play. I want to show you time for any one of the questions. Any other questions? All right. So let me leave you this before we go to spring break. Um, the cases we've done so far on equal protection have narrowed the 14th Amendment. Starting next week when you get back, the 14th Amendment starts getting broader and broader. All right. And if you have questions, come back. We're sorry to cut you short. Thank you so much.